All right, we are here for Central Florida Comic Con. We're gonna be interviewing Jason Narvi from Power Ranger. That's pretty cool. All right, so let's get into it. Woo! Are you ready? Oh, um, I don't know. I don't know. When you say it like that, I feel like I'm not. <laughs> Intimidation. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> it's time for another on the spot. On the spot. So my most popular video online so far is the 25th anniversary video featuring the original cast of Power Rangers. One of the things I asked them was about their experience watching the show evolve into pop culture hysteria. I'm curious though, as someone who wasn't morphing, kicking, or driving dinosaur zords around, mm -hmm. what's the experience like for you watching the show become what it did? Did you share their milestones the same way or was it slightly different? I mean, it was slightly different for us because while, while all the kids were looking up to them, they were... They're looking down on us. They're that big. They're looking down on us. <laughs> um, so it was a little bit different, but all the same, because Paulie and I have this background in theater, and because we have this this uh, belief that as an actor, you want to be a working actor, it was brilliant. It was beautiful. You know. Now, we didn't get to put our hands you know, in the cement like they did. We were the MCs, and that kind of ruffled our feathers a little bit. <laughs> but it also kept our feet on the ground, and it kept us thinking like a good theater creator that we needed to work harder and come up with new things and come up with new what ifs. Yeah. So it was different from a, for us a little bit but it, we still couldn't leave the house without, <laughs> we couldn't leave the house. Well, people were like, oh my god! Yeah, it was very odd to go to McDonald's or Disneyland <laughs> and suddenly like a crowd getting, of people. Yeah, uh, getting pinned down at Disneyland. I'm like, don't you want to go see Mickey Mouse? <laughs> He's more famous than me. You know, so that was weird. So we got to be in the fishbowl, but unlike the Rangers, we didn't have to be role models. <laughs> I read you originally auditioned for Billy the Blue Ranger. Was there ever a want on your part to suit up and get out there to mix it up like them? Or did you relish in the fact that you got to be the comic relief of the show and make kids around the world laugh despite, you know, not having one of those hard-to-find Christmas toys in the 90s? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone wants to have an action figure of themselves, right? <laughs> uh, no, because it was because I had a, a partner in this, right? We had more fun than anybody else on the set. We knew it. You know, that was super, super duper cool. We were the outsiders. And that's who Paulie and I always were, right? And if you go into theater, I, I never believe that you become somebody else. You always bring yourself along with it. And you are not uh, Hamlet. Hamlet is a different variation of you because you have to show the experiences of Hamlet, right? Yeah. You can't do that honestly unless you understand it and you've experienced it, right? So therefore, you're always, whatever character you're doing is part of you. Does that make sense? Yeah, just a little. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm doing it in shorthand. Um, and that's how Bulk and Skull were. They were, they were more deviant than we were. They were uh, a little more... Uh, rebellious they got away with more crap than ever we did <laughs> but we still did those kinds of things as our own people so we were able to live our alter egos yeah. you know so I don't think we would have changed it now now if it would have been Bulk and Skull become superheroes that would have been different and those guys would have been a very different kind of superhero but back then back then we did not have the outsider as superhero we just did I mean I guess Clark Kent is was a nerd. He had a good job. I mean, you know, Bulk and Skull. He was pretty good looking. He had a good job. I think he, I think he was set. But yeah, you know. he was set. He was working for a major <laughs> metropolitan newspaper. You know, Bulk and Skull are like the guys that, I don't know, are trying to get the job at Jiffy Lube. But no, <laughs> we're not going to let you do that. No way. You need to know how a car operates, man. You need some knowledge. So Bulk and Skull are like, okay, they're the homeless guys that, you know, steal things. <laughs> Even the characters, Bulk and Skull, were bullies and... As you said before, they wouldn't work the same way today. They did evolve into security guards and cops who save people and more. I'm curious, though, what happens to Skull? And the last time we saw him, he was dressed in a suit in the back of the limo. Yeah. Uh, what was his life like in those nine years missing? And where would you like to think of him now? Yeah, it's funny because when, when I came back to do it, you know, I'm trying to reimagine the character, and I could not get him out of my head as somebody who was 20 years old. You know, I couldn't. I mean, that, that kind of stupidity. I'm sorry, I know you're probably around 20 years old, but... like you, 14! You, when you turn 20, you get really dumb. <laughs> no, no, but that's the thing, right? Um, when you uh, uh, get older, you're supposed to get smarter. 
And when you're young, you, you, you know, you're like, you know, I'm going to stick my finger in that light socket. Like, that's okay, you know? So I just couldn't imagine that guy surviving his 20s, you know? <laughs> like, you'd think Evolution or Darwin would step in and be like, mm, your line is cut you're, off. You're done. You're done. And yet he has reproduced. So it's like, ugh, ugh. Um, so I like to think, like, I've got a few jokes about it. You know, people are like, oh, he's a genius. I'm like, no. Oh, well, he played piano and he made a fortune. Oh, yeah, because that happened. That totally Yeah, happened. because musicians. Wow, those guys always make it. I said it's got to be something ridiculous. So I, it was one of two things, I think. Either he worked at a toll booth, and the toll was, like, so close to a dollar. You know, it was, like, 99 cents. And Skull, it would take him so long to make the change. He'd be like, here's a dollar. And he'd be like... That would be me. <laughs> Do, people are like, just keep the money. And they just sped off. And after the year, it's like, okay. And he just had all that money left over from people who sped off because they got tired of waiting. Or he's an insurance adjuster. And he is so shell-shocked and such a coward that when people talk about, you know, there's a brand new building in downtown Angel Grove, they're like, I think we should insure it. He's like, don't do it, it's going to fall. They're going to step on you. <laughs> Monsters. You're like, ah, oh, that's Skull Guy. He really knows because we really did get torn down by monsters. Here, let's give him a raise. That's what I think. <laughs> like, one of those two things, I think, is what happened to Skull. Besides a few short films, you don't do much TV acting outside of Power Rangers. I found you're a theater professor at Concordia in Chicago with a PhD. Yes. Is theater something you've always been attracted to? Yes, I did it before I ever did uh, television. It's what I, it, it's kind of my first love. Both Paulie and I have a really good relationship because both of us started doing theater, right? It's the best place to learn how to act and how to story tell. So even when we're doing Power Rangers, if we ever had any downtime, we'd go find time to go do theater. So when I when I took a break from Power Rangers to go to college, that's why I left the show, actually. Um, I wanted to study theater, and while I was there, I decided I wanted to help young people learn to do it because I think it's, it's pretty important to be able to curate um, stories in places where and uh, places where we tell those stories. You were actually trained in stage combat by the British Academy of Combat mm -hmm. and you have a doctorate in theater studies at uh, from UC Santa Barbara. It must be a big shock for casual fans when they realize one half of Bulk and Skull is a, to be addressed as Dr. Narvi <laughs> and he can keep up a stage fight with the best of them. What's it like when fans of the show or even your students uh, find this information out? trying to make sense of who they thought you were compared to the reality. Don't we all try to, like, don't we all have a kind of buffer between who we are and how the world perceives us? Yeah. You know, we really do. You know, so the good thing about having credentials is that I don't I don't feel that I need to prove something to somebody. Look, I know things. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I never looked at myself as, as a particularly... Um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Proficient person in anything. And I always work my ass off. So if anyone says, oh my God, you did all those things. You must be awesome. I'm like, I'm not any more awesome than you are. You know, I struggled to get these things. You can struggle and you can get these things. You know? So I think we should all have little mysteries and twists and turns. And we, 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 we're not going to, none of us fit into a nice little mold, do we? You know? so, so true. If, so if we're a deviant... Be a smart deviant, you know? If we're going to be an academic, be a rebel, you know? If you're going to be a stage combatant, be a sleeper, you know? I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Bam! <laughs> Theater is a really big part of my life, so I'm curious if you can tell me some of the plays that you've done, you enjoy, some of the characters, you know, you had fun doing on stage. Mm -hmm. I always love hearing about what drives people to perform on the stage. Oh, well, let me ask you. Oh, <laughs> turn the tables. Now, now we're getting really professorial, Okay. <laughs> Uh, using the Socratic method, what shows have you done? I have done, let's see, I've done Lion King twice, mm -hmm. all right? I've done Willy Wonka, Little Mermaid, Bye Bye Birdie. Bye Bye Birdie. You high know, School Musical twice, which, and which, Back which, to the 80s. High School Musical twice. Yes. Okay. Did you know, okay, what is the important thing about Bye Bye Birdie in the history of musicals? Go. Uh, it's... Uh, oh. I'm going blank. It's the first, it's actually the first musical that had rock and roll. Oh. It's the first rock and roll musical. Now, this is interesting. Okay. Um, so, we were just watching, are you familiar with Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella? Yes. We were just watching it. And we were noticing that it didn't have good character development. And we're like, why not? 
Well, Rodgers and Hammerstein wrote that musical specifically for TV, which meant they had it truncated. So Rodgers and Hammerstein, who have 12-minute songs sometimes to build their characters, and they back then they did characters better than anyone else in musical theater, right? They have these super yeah. rich characters. Well, now in Cinderella, the characters are kind of flat. Yeah. Well, now here's the interesting thing. When Bye Bye Birdie came out, the prevailing wisdom was that musicals, uh, rock and roll, could not sustain a musical because rock music was only three-minute rock and roll songs back then, right? Think about it. Those old Beatles songs, Elvis songs, um, punk rock songs are the same way. I mean, let's face it, Queen and Bohemian Rhapsody and the you know six-minute aria operatic song, that didn't exist in rock and roll. Yeah. So that was the prevailing wisdom. Is you couldn't do a rock musical because of the fact that rock is too short to sustain a narrative. So that being said, I believe for about 60 years, we didn't have any musicals that represented what people listen to on the radio whatsoever. So people like musical theater music, but they're not going to listen to it on the radio. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? I would. I mean, you would, of course. You're a theater <laughs> geek. You're a theater kid. You know? Um, that's where my head goes when I think about theater. But that being said, uh, I've done a ton of Shakespeare. So I've done Hamlet, Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet, uh, Henry V, Henry the Six, Parts 1, 2, and 3. Um, I just did, when I was in Indianapolis, we did an original play called In the Soundless Awe, written by Jamie McGann and Andrew Peterson, directed by Brian Fruits, which was about the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. That was the hardest play I ever did, because in the opening moments, uh, I was following the, 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 the role of uh, Captain McVeigh, the captain of the Indianapolis who committed suicide. Oh. So in the opening moments of the play, we have to commit suicide and then go up to the moments that lead to that. So that was tough. Uh, I have done, I've directed a bunch of musicals. Three Penny oh. Opera, Next to Normal. Uh, Next to Normal? Yeah, do you know Next to Normal? Oh, I know Next to Normal. Next to Normal is like Arthur Miller <laughs> in a musical form. It's, it's a, it's a six-person, five-person, six-person uh, uh, family drama. Yeah. Musicals don't do that. That's why I love that play. It's a Pulitzer Prize winning play and it freaking deserves it. Um, so there's a few of the plays that I have done. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> you get a little off topic. It's okay. It's okay. Favorite characters I've done in theater. Um, Leontes in The Winter's Tale is one of my favorites. Um, he is a bad... He's not a bad king. He's a bad husband, right? He's a tyrant of a king. And he messes up terribly and destroys his family on the first half of the play. In the second half of the play, he tries to get back everything he lost. Um, and then he gets everything back almost. Because he don't deserve to get it all back. It was just kind of, so that's a fascinating story arc. Hamlet, everyone loves Hamlet. He's a fascinating character. Did you? Let's face it, he's freaking yeah. Hamlet. <laughs> you know, so that's certainly one of my favorites. I mean, oh, God. There's too many plays. <laughs> I mean, every play you do, you make it your favorite. Oh, yeah. You know, you make that particular role your favorite role forever <laughs> until you start the next play. Yeah. That was me. I was, uh, when I first did High School the first time, I was Sharpay, and then the second time I was Ryan, ah. and it immediately switched over. Fun. <laughs> Have you done any straight plays yet? Uh, we did, at my new school, we just did one, but I wasn't a part of it. Oh, my God. He didn't, he, he didn't cast me, and I was like, oh, okay. Are you familiar with this play? Kui Gwen. No. He, <laughs> he's got the best <laughs> name of any theater company, Vampire Cowboys Theater Company. His plays are plays for geeks. He did a, a play called She Kills Monsters, and it's about this girl who wants to understand her sister's love of role play, and so she goes on this little adventure with the ghost of her sister. So this one <laughs> is as though Ophelia comes back, uh, I haven't gotten all the way through the play, but as though Ophelia came back in, in a kind of Night of the Living Dead and kicks everyone's ass. Oh, You've that. got to read it. So that if you okay. are a geek and you love theater, this is the playwright for you. All right. I'm just saying. <laughs> or Mr. Burns post-apocalyptic play. It's it's basically post-apocalypse, and the Simpsons are our religion. Oh. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. That's awesome. Listen, you have learned later in life that you should have known sooner. Later in life that I wish I had known sooner. Um, well, I mean, it's kind of the whole reason I went to college. Um, I think that if there's no such thing as having made it. The only person you satisfy is yourself. So you should always keep working, keep evolving, and getting better at whatever you do. That being said, I, uh, you don't have to stay in that one lane. You know, um, you can move on. Um, you can, you can reinvent yourself to the outside world. 
which makes you a functional member of society, but you always stay yourself. That you're the one person you can't run away from. You can't take a road trip away from yourself. There's no road that long. <laughs> All right, and that's it. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. All right, and that is it for Central Florida Comic Con. I hope you guys enjoyed. I had a great time here as Kenny. So I'll see you guys in the next one. Make sure you subscribe, like, and share all that cool stuff. Later.